United States, your ass belong to me. They don't give a damn about you. They don't like you. I don't like you. Nobody likes you. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight. You're a racist. Who the hell is I? Uh, I knew this was going to happen. Who is that? Trump's a racist. <laughs> It's Larry David. What are you doing, Larry? I heard if I yelled that, they'd give me $5,000. <laughs> As a businessman, I can fully respect that. That's okay. Um, how you look at the other cases, um, and if you think there's any validity to them. Because there are five no. cases we're talking about. He's guilty of the first three so far out of three. Some of them feel trumped up. Um, but what about the last two? You know, the, the documents and the January 6th ones, do you think there's any validity to them? No, no validity. The Zero. only The only thing that Trump was potentially in trouble on and the thing I hit him on when we interviewed was not turning over the documents once he had a subpoena. Which would have been so easy to do. Yes. But Which was dumb, but he's Trump. He, he should have he he turned him over. He but always he does self-destructive stuff. But that one's gone away now, too, because of Jack Smith not being properly appointed down there. But so, in answer to your question on, on Judge Mershon, I think... Um, he, he almost is in a position where he might have to sentence him to jail, given how big they've tried to make it. You stole an election. You stole. But it'll, it would be at a suspended sentence. It would be immediately appealed. And I think Trump on appeal will win. There are so many holes in that case. So I don't think Trump will ever do one single day in jail. So, Megan, if um, we look at the five cases, you know, six months from now, a year from now, let's assume all five of them go to trial. Um, he's guilty of three so far. Wait, what do, you, what do you mean he's guilty of three so far? Well, what he's been convicted about? of three, sorry. What do you mean? No, he hasn't. Um, I love the, this. Ellen, uh, no, E. Jean, Car e. Jean Carroll was guilty. That was not a conviction. That was a civil case. Okay, well, yes, yeah, so that's what I'm talking about. So that okay, one but there's was, a big difference. It, it still, he was convicted. He was guilty in the, of that. He got a settlement. Um, in the... Yeah, and the Trump organization, they're guilty there. That, okay? Again, with the CFO. civil, libel, libel. Uh, yes, of course. But we're, these are the cases we're talking about. And in the third one... Uh, you know she's one, a lawyer, right? Yeah, of course. And in the third one... <laughs> I'm just talking about the five cases. Yes, some are civil, obviously, and, and, and some, some are not. Some are criminal. But if we look you at all five You said three cases, convictions. Now you're walking it back. I'm not walking it back. There's Get three in which he was... You should walk it back. Okay, I'm guys, so glad easy. Megan is here of the five, to, to three of them, this. he's either guilty or... You, you know, got a bad result. Yeah, got a bad result. There are two more. If he is found guilty of those two more, Megan, um, and five of five, he had a bad result. Um, way to frame it. Um, will, will you chalk all five up in your mind to five different jurisdictions, five different prosecutors, five different juries and or judges, all conspiring to get him? 100%. Okay. Yes. <laughs> That's all I wanted to hear your answer to. They're, five they're, of five, five different jurisdictions. Yeah. You think it's all lawful? I mean, Eugene Carroll, they, they changed the law so that she could bring a civil lawsuit no against problem. him, just, and she did. New York jury, New York went 87% for Joe Biden. That, that, that fix was in right from the start. The fraud trial that Letitia James brought against yep. him has never been brought. There's no victims. The banks who were involved said, we didn't lose a penny. What are we doing here? We weren't damaged. Yep. Nobody was complaining except Tish James, who ran for office saying, I will yep. get him. Then you have Alvin Bragg, who's a George Soros-funded prosecutor who doesn't like to prosecute any crime in New York City where I lived for 17 years, except if your name is Donald Trump. Let's go down to Georgia, where Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade couldn't keep their libidos in check long enough to actually bring this case against Donald Trump. It's a repeat of what was happening in January 6th up in the case with Judge Chutkin, who loathes Trump and has sentenced almost every J6 defendant to way more jail time than their counterparts would get. Those are falling apart because of presidential immunity, which was handed down by the Supreme Court, who said you cannot bring a criminal case against a sitting president for any official act. Those cases are, have been gutted. Also, a Supreme Court ruling saying the same on January 6th defendants in general. And that leaves us with Florida and the documents. And Trump has torn that apart because Jack Smith wasn't properly appointed and isn't the right counsel. But there are other issues. They haven't even gotten to presidential immunity there. And so... Th that one's going nowhere as well. And by the way, they're going to peel it up to the 11th Circuit. She just threw it out. The 11th Circuit is conservative, and thank God so is the current Supreme Court. They're not going to tolerate that nonsense. Let me ask you okay. about... Um... I think... Let me... Let I, me think just ask you. I think Jay Cal just lost his right to ever bring up lawfare again. <laughs> <laughs>
Whether through neglect or on purpose, I saw a large-scale lapse in our ability to return people to their country of origin. The current administration, however, from day one, made a point of decreasing the amount of detention space available nationwide. Immigration and Customs Enforcement's funding for detention has steadily been cut and private detention eliminated. The fact that so many illegal aliens are being released into the United States spread worldwide very quickly. As this happened, the numbers the Border Patrol encountered illegally crossing the border increased exponentially. In San Diego, we had an exponential increase in significant interest aliens. These are aliens with significant ties to terrorism. At the time, I was told I could not release any information on this increase in SIAs or mention any of the arrests. The administration was trying to convince the public there was no threat at the border. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members, thank you for this opportunity. The only true consequence we have to slow down and discourage people from coming into the United States illegally is sending them back to their country of origin. Throughout the first three plus years of this administration, I saw a steady decrease in the countries we could send people back to. For the first time in my 25 years and under five different administrations, whether through neglect or on purpose, I saw a large scale lapse in our ability to return people to their country of origin. The inability to send people home meant that most people being arrested for illegal entry would either have to be detained or released. The current administration, however, from day one, made a point of decreasing the amount of detention space available nationwide. Immigration and Customs Enforcement's funding for detention has steadily been cut and private detention eliminated. The fact that so many illegal aliens are being released into the United States spread worldwide very quickly. As this happened, the numbers the Border Patrol encountered illegally crossing the border increased exponentially. The impact to me and my agents were significant. Sectors were ordered to take in and process all the illegal aliens encountered on the border. The Border Patrol saw groups of hundreds and thousands coming into the United States and turning themselves in. These numbers pulled 80, 90, sometimes 100% of the agents on duty away from the border. Border Patrol zones across Texas, Arizona, and California had no agent presence for weeks and months at a time. Those who did not want to be caught could simply walk in. We have no idea who and what entered our country over this time. Throughout 2022 and 23, I sent agents to Texas and Arizona to count gotaways. Those sectors could not even put enough agents in the field to see what they'd missed. Simultaneously, in San Diego, we had an exponential increase in significant interest aliens. These are aliens with significant ties to terrorism. Prior to this administration, the San Diego sector averaged 10 to 15 SIA arrests per year. Once word was out, the border was far easier to cross. San Diego went to over 100 SIAs in 2022. Well over that in 2023, and even more than that registered this year. These are only the ones we caught. At the time, I was told I could not release any information on this increase in SIAs or mention any of the arrests. The administration was trying to convince the public there was no threat at the border. Fentanyl is another issue. The San Diego area sees between 80 and 90% of the methamphetamine and fentanyl seizures annually for our entire country. With little enforcement at the border, these drugs were coming through in mass. During my last year in San Diego, the price for a single pill of fentanyl, for example, went from $10 to 25 cents. To make matters worse, during 2022 and 23, I had to shut down San Diego traffic checkpoints, which are critical for drug interdiction, because the resources had been diverted to the process and release mission. The large numbers also had and still have a negative impact on the San Diego community. I had to release illegal aliens by the hundreds each day into communities who could not support them. To quiet the problem, two flights a week were provided from San Diego to Texas. These flights simply brought aliens that would have been released in San Diego over to Texas. Each flight cost approximately $150,000. This was the administration's way to try and quiet the border-wide crisis. Once these flights were stopped and the releases continued, California saw the true economic impact. I received calls from the governor's office, local mayors, and hospital administrators asking me if we could keep injured aliens in custody so the federal government would pay the medical bills. Through pressure from the administration, my headquarters became more interested in the fiction that being portrayed in the media and not at all concerned with reality. Each time we asked for help in dealing with a new issue, it fell on deaf ears. At times in San Diego, we had 2,000 or more aliens sitting in between the fences asking to turn themselves in. I was told to move them out of sight of the media. 
Meanwhile, Border Patrol agents are continually forgotten and neglected by the media and this administration. These agents deal with death, women and children that have been raped, abused, trafficked, bought and sold, families that have spent months in terrible conditions, sickness and despair. If you look at the dramatic rise in the number of suicides within the Border Patrol, it is directly correlated with the migrant surge. The agents have been pushed beyond their limit and this has greatly impacted their physical and mental health. While current numbers of aliens crossing our border are lower in comparison in recent months, there's a reason for this. After nearly four years, this administration finally started to ask Mexico for help in slowing down the traffic through their country. This and other actions make a difference, but why has it taken so long? All of these tactics were being used before this administration took office, but this administration stopped or greatly limited them. I'm also concerned this will not be maintained. The problems we are facing at the border have solutions. These solutions can be quite simple and cost far less than the mess currently occupying so much time and money. The return to a policy of enforcing the law and returning illegal aliens to their home countries is required. Mr. Heike, uh, you served as the last job you were the sector chief of one of our nine southwest border sectors. And uh, I think you said you worked for 25 years in the Border Patrol under five different administrations. And looking at your statement, you said this was the first time under those under five administrations, whether through neglect or on purpose, I saw large scale lapses in our ability to return people to their country of origin. You, you th then went on and talked about detention and how detention bed space was intentionally decreased and private detention was essentially done away with. You said that that word got out and then the, the masses came, essentially, I'm paraphrasing you. But I, I want to go back to your comment about whether it was neglectful or purposeful, because if you, if you intentionally stop returning people, that's not something you just, oh, well, you neglect, you, and you intentionally decrease detention, those things that actually decrease the incentive for people to come here. That sounds purposeful to me. So would you answer, I mean, do you think it's neglect or do you think it's this was purposeful, designed to be this way? I b believe that the actions were purposeful, yes, sir. The, many people don't understand that we can't simply fill a plane full of nationals from a certain country and fly them home. It takes agreements with that country. It takes uh, diplomacy with the State Department. Um, to, to make those arrangements, and they're long-term arrangements. Uh, it, it takes diplomacy over months and years. But, and, but purposeful. But purposeful. Purposeful, yes. okay. Um, so you mentioned, too, that there were massive periods of time when the border was just left completely open because the agents had to be pulled and you were directed to do this. Uh, and, and how long were, the, were, were those agents just completely off the border and miles of the border wide open? There were weeks and even, even months at a time uh, between Texas and parts of, uh, parts of Arizona and California. And I, I assume that's, you know, we want to look at these eight ISIS folks that were caught in New York. I guess some of them actually crossed at a crossing. They filled out the CBP-1 app, three of them, and came into the country and we're going to blow up an LGBTQ place in, uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, but, I mean, those people that cross during that time, we, any guarantees that they're not out there to, to do harm to the country? And no, sir, no guarantees. Yeah, you agree with the FBI director then. Um, you mentioned twice in your testimony, too, I find it fascinating that because it was over, overwhelming San Diego, the administration actually created for the cost of $150,000 plane flights to Texas of all these people. Um, as, as a way to keep it quiet. And then you mentioned, too, um, that there was one point where you had like 2,000 aliens and the administration directed you to like move them out of sight of the media. Uh, can, can you kind of clarify that a little bit? Yes, sir. Groups were coming in to turn themselves over faster than we could keep up. We only had so much space. We keep people within our stations. There's no other place to, to put them in while they're being processed. And they were building up. The media was showing them sitting in between the fences. And it looked bad, and they wanted them moved. I had no place to put them, and so they simply told me. Why would they want to hide that? Why wouldn't they want the world to know what's going on? Why would they want to hide that? Why would they want to spend $150,000 to fly them to Texas to keep people from seeing the mass waves? Why? 
It looks bad. I was, when I asked about the flights to Texas, I was very specifically told there's a problem in Texas, there isn't a problem in California. <laughs> wow. So purposeful policies wreaking havoc on a community, and we'll just hide it. Exploiting the migrant crisis to build a violent criminal empire. Originally from Venezuela, the gang has infiltrated city shelters right under the noses of authorities. So a dangerous gang has infiltrated shelters in New York City and is now using one of them as their headquarters. And although over 200,000 asylum seekers have come here without the intention of joining gangs or committing crime, this gang from Venezuela is forcing people in our shelters to join them and they aren't taking no for an answer. America has allowed gangs to enter our country. So it seems the worst of criminals are taking advantage of New York City's asylum crisis. But this gang problem has been growing all year long right here in America's largest sanctuary city and nobody's done anything to stop it. Even after captured gang members warned authorities that things were about to get worse. Because earlier this year, a moped crime ring was taken down and that gang's leader warned authorities that the crimes he was committing were just a drop in the bucket. Which turned out to be true because this past summer we saw a wave of robberies by thugs at restaurants and even in Central Park, revealing that something's happening in New York to grow our gang problem. And it's happening right under our noses as we run one of the largest humanitarian relief operations in the country, with massive shelters that still house around 50,000 people, and which no longer function as the humanitarian care centers they were set up to be, because they've been infiltrated by a network of criminals who even after they get kicked out of our shelters still end up coming back. A massive problem, not just for a city that claims it wants to help asylum seekers by taking care of them, but also for asylum seekers who fled poverty and violence in their home countries to come to America seeking a better life, only to find the very same gangs that destroyed the place they left. Which brings us to the real reason why we've now got gangs taking over shelters in New York and homes in other parts of the country. Sure, the idea of a humane, borderless society with no restrictions sounds like heaven on earth to some, until one realizes the forces of evil have been infiltrating these bastions of progressivism for a long time, causing harm to the innocent whether they live in a city-run shelter or not. And as you're about to see, these gangs have had almost two years at this point to take over and convert some of our shelters into their bases of operations. And they're doing it by forcing people getting off buses like these to help them, whether they like it or not. So here we are behind New York City's Port Authority bus terminal, the first destination of many asylum seekers who are headed here. And although the next stop many have to make after arriving is to head over to the Roosevelt Hotel for their initial shelter placement, many of New York City's shelters have now been infiltrated by criminals and there have been reports of rising gang violence at many of the facilities throughout the system, not just the giant tents over at Randall's Island. And obviously this is a huge problem for those fleeing gangs and criminal activity where they're from. But who now find themselves confronted by the type of criminals nobody ever imagined would be found in America. But critics are now saying the dysfunctional shelter system here in New York is precisely what's allowed these gangs to grow. And that raises a big question. Why would somebody come all the way here and get off a bus, try to start a new life, but then join a gang? Why would somebody do that? Randall's Island, where a large tent city has been set up to accommodate migrants, has become a recruitment hub for the gang. Prende Aragua uses fear tactics to strong are migrants into joining, threatening their families back home if they resist. For those who refuse, they're labeled enemies of the gang. Now with its reach... Ex Sadly, that is a very persuasive offer, and it's being offered to people who have no connection to New York City at all and no base. They're here on their own, and they're told if they don't join a gang, they're going to become an enemy of that gang. And apparently this is happening most commonly at the massive tent facility on Randall's Island, which houses around 3,000 people, but has now been taken over by gang gang members who apparently have no problem recruiting new members from that facility, many of whom arrived in the city only days beforehand and are just getting settled. But sadly, the violence in our shelter system doesn't just affect newly arrived single adults, it's also affecting families, as several of the teenagers who were caught robbing people recently throughout the city and in Central Park claimed residence at the Roosevelt Hotel, where they lived with their parents. And that facility is a former luxury hotel, much better than a giant tent with a bunch of cots lined up next to each other proving that we don't just have a gang 
violence and gang growth problem in one of our facilities. This is pervasive throughout the entire system. And it's an absolute nightmare scenario for parents who are now watching their kids get swept up in the violence they thought they'd left behind. And for the tens of thousands of single adults who are basically being told to join these gangs or suffer the consequences for not doing so. Good afternoon, Chairman McClintock, Ranking Member Japal, and distinguished members of the committee. It is an honor to be here. I thank you for the invitation to share my testimony. My goal is to inspire action to safeguard the lives of migrant children, including the staggering 85,000 that are missing. Today, children will work overnight shifts at slaughterhouses, factories, restaurants to pay their debts to smugglers and traffickers. Today, children will be sold for sex. Today, children will call a hotline to report they are being abused, neglected, and trafficked. And we don't know if they're going to get the help they need. For nearly a decade, unaccompanied children have been suffering in the shadows. And I have to confess, I knew nothing about their suffering until 2021, when I volunteered to help the Biden administration with the crisis at the southern border. As part of Operation Artemis, I was deployed to the Pomona Fairplex Emergency Intake Site in California to help HHS, Office of Refugee Resettlement, reunite children with sponsors in the United States. I thought I was going to help place children in loving homes. Instead, I discovered that children are being trafficked through a sophisticated network that begins with recruiting in home country, smuggling to the U.S. border, and ends when ORR delivers a child to a sponsor. Some sponsors are criminals and traffickers and members of transnational criminal organizations. Some sponsors view children as commodities and assets to be used for earning income. This is why we are witnessing an explosion of labor trafficking. Now, whether it's intentional or not, it could be argued that the United States government has become the middleman in a large-scale, multi-billion dollar child trafficking operation that is run by bad actors seeking to profit off of the lives of children. As for me, my interest is the safety of the children. I do not view this as a political issue. I view this as a humanitarian issue. I assure you, my motives are the highest and best. I want the children protected. So I want to tell you some of what I witnessed personally at the Pomona Fairplex. I saw vulnerable indigenous children from Guatemala who speak Mayan dialects and cannot speak Spanish. That means they cannot ask for help in English. They cannot help for, ask for help in Spanish. They become captives of their sponsors. I have sat with case managers as they've cried to tell me the horror of what has happened to children as they make the journey to this country. I saw apartment buildings where 20, 30, and 40 unaccompanied minors have been released. I saw sponsors trying to simultaneously sponsor children from multiple ORR sites at one time. I saw sponsors using multiple addresses to abstain, obtain sponsorships of children. And I saw numerous cases of children in debt bondage and the child knew they had to stay with the sponsor until the debt was paid. Realizing that we were not offering the children the American dream, but instead putting them in modern day slavery with wicked overlords was a terrible revelation. A terrible revelation. These children are a captive victim population with no access to law enforcement or knowledge of their rights. They are extorted, abused, neglected. And that is why I blew the whistle in 2021. I witnessed firsthand the horrors of child trafficking and exploitation. My life will never be the same after what I saw. But I have hope because I'm counting on you. It's my hope that you'll take action to end this crisis, to safeguard the lives of, most of these vulnerable children. People have asked me, you know, what can be done? What would you suggest? Well, first, I think HHS's number one priority is oversight. They must commit to oversight, transparency, and accountability. If I could wave a magic wand, this, I believe, could be quickly solved by experts in the IG community. There is a Pandemic Analytics Center of Excellence, or the PACE, as we call it. 
I believe if data analysts at the pace could look at the data, children could be rescued, criminals could be prosecuted. If the pace had access to this data, it shows where the children are and who has them. I think also we need to change the culture of speed over safety. Speed is the wrong performance measure when dealing with children. We need to revamp the vetting process of sponsors and have case managers who have investigative backgrounds, data analytics backgrounds, some certified fraud examiners. And I think we need to reimagine a system where the sponsor is the accountable party. Sponsors should be required to report to ORR. And lastly, stop retaliating against whistleblowers. Stop retaliating against the people who are trying to tell the truth to save the children. Yeah, and Sandra, bear with me. We just got these numbers moments ago, but uh, it, it's a jaw dropper to say the least. So to set the stage here, let me just explain what these numbers mean. ICE has something called a non-detained docket. Essentially what that is, is it means migrants who were encountered by DHS but are no longer in federal custody. So who's on this non-detained docket? It's illegal immigrants who were caught and released at the border, released with the court date years away. They're in immigration proceedings combined with illegal immigrants who have already been ordered, deported from the country by a judge, but are still here roaming the country. So keep that in mind, this non-detained docket. Uh, according to a letter that the acting director of ICE just sent to Texas Congressman Tony Gonzalez, uh, on ICE's non-detained docket, they're currently tracking 425,000 uh, non-citizens who have been convicted of a crime. Of that number, over 13,000 non-citizens have convictions for homicide and are on the non-detained docket, meaning they're roaming the country right now. On top of that, there are another 15,811 non-citizens convicted of sexual assault who are roaming the country right now on ICE's non-detained docket. It doesn't stop there. Those are convictions. The ICE director also says there are currently just under 1,900 non-citizens on the non-detained docket who have pending homicide charges who are roaming the country and another 4,250 non-citizens who have pending sexual assault charges who are roaming the country on the non-detained docket. So